anyways, so uh, I guess we'll get started. Um, so my goal for tonight was to finish up our discussion of testing. Um, I don't expect our conversation to go beyond for, for testing up to about halfway through. Um, the rest of it, we're going to transition over into security, which um, I think Ryan was going to discuss for tonight. Um, security is a, a big topic, but it's a very little chapter in this book. So, um, you know, we'll just kind of cover the topics there and whatever else Ryan has um, for that subject and stuff. So uh, I think we'll just get started. Uh, let's see. Let me share my screen. So where we left off. Just off three. Again, just a, another quick disclaimer uh, about myself and my experience. This is now two weeks worth of experience that I now have in testing. So uh, if anybody's watching this later on, just recognize anything that I discuss uh, is going to be very base level and not, might not be 100% correct. So again, if, if anybody here or anybody in the future uh, sees any corrections, please just let me know. Um, again, because this is two weeks worth of experience on testing and um, I'm still learning. But so uh, what we talked about last time was we talked about kind of like the general purpose of testing and why we do it. We talked about the different levels of testing in Shiny. Uh, we talked about the use of test that. So we were talking about using um, test that as the package to develop our testing framework for our applications. We discussed somewhat of a recommended workflow of developing tests and how um, tests are organized within your Shiny app package structure, and also discussing how you kind of set those up with test that and then your expectation functions. And then we did some examples of testing non-reactive functions. So we did some unit, we discussed unit testing a little bit, and then we were moving on into testing reactivity. And so that's where we left off last time. And so um, where we're going to pick up is, is, well, first, I kind of want to show you a quick example. Oh, we also discussed snapshots, excuse me. Um, so we discussed snapshots. I did want to share with you um, an example of what a snapshot looks like, because I did catch an issue with my previous code from last time. Um, I For everyone to kind of remember we um, what this was, is we were creating a testing framework for this application here. Um, oh, shoot. So we were creating a testing framework for this basic application. Go watch the previous video to kind of see more about what this is all about, but we were just kind of creating a testing framework for this. And one thing that I was trying to do is create a snapshot test for um, some input functions that we had for our application. And so um, to do that, because our input functions, they just spit out HTML, we can use a snapshot expectation within our tests. And what that basically is, is that with the snaps, it creates a separate MD file with all of our output code or the expectation of what should be outputted by that UI function. So all that HTML. And so what I was doing is I caught an actual issue here because what I was using was I was using this date range input when I actually had a function that was called date range input floor month or something like that. And what was happening is, is I would keep testing it and I would make changes here but it wouldn't fail the test and I couldn't figure out why. And the reason being because I was using in my test, I was using date range input. So it would always pass, it would, all, it would always pass, always pass. So I caught that. And then, so this gave me a great example of how the snapshot works. And so um, I changed it to date range input here. And here's what that testing looks like. And so what it does is it runs that test, it fails, and then what it does is it says, hey, what was outputted by that UI function doesn't match what your snapshot is. And this is what it basically looks like. It outputs the difference between the two. So very similar to um, version control where it just looks for the differences and it shows you what the differences are. But then it gives you this option of snapshot accept. So if this change does happen and it's supposed to happen after you kind of review it, you can run this function right here in your console and it will update that snapshot file. And so the next time that you run that test, it will pass. 
So um, I thought that was kind of neat because, you know, helped me kind of catch an issue with my testing framework that I had was because I had a false positive because it was keep saying that the test would pass, the test was passed, but I wasn't modifying any function that I actually created. I was just testing this date range input. So um, until I modified it to the actual correct function, which I can do later, but I'm not going to do it now for the sake of time. Um, that's how that kind of snapshot test kind of failed. So now moving on to what I was going to talk about, I was going to discuss the um, reactive, uh, testing reactives. And so let me pull this back over here. Uh, testing reactivity. So when we're testing reactivity, um, what we're going to do is with reactive, reactive or testing reactivity, we need to set up a server, the actual thing that runs. And we also need to set up a server function within our tests. And so our tests also are going to require data to which is going to come from the reactive. And so to kind of show you how to do that in our testing framework is we have this. Um, so I'll show you the application. Again, the application code. So in the application code, I'm sorry, guys, my, my mouse is not working very well as, as it has in the past. So if we go back to the application code here, um, what we have here is we have this basic reactive for data. And so all this reactive is doing is it's taking that web data and then it's filtering. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually test if this is filtering like I want it to filter. And so what I've created is I've created this file in my test that directory that tests that, that reactive. So the data that's being outputted by that reactive. And so it's the same kind of framework that we set up with our expect, expected data. Here's that test data. And we run that in our expect equal. And so we're basically we're looking at as we're looking at does the, does the data that we get returned from that reactive expression match up with our test data. But what's different about this now is because we're using the server function, we have to wrap our expect equal inside of this test server function from Shiny because it has to kick off a server session to actually pass in our input, our output, and our session information into that running server. And so basically what we're doing here is then we also pass in this session set inputs inside of this test server function um, to you know, set up those two inputs. And the input that we're testing here is the date range because the date range is what filters it, right? So here's the low end of the date range, the high end of the date range. And what we're doing is we're just running that expectation saying that once we have, once that reactive has those inputs, the data that we should expect to return is these dates right here. One thing that I do want to highlight that I kind of came across when I was looking at this was when I first was setting up my test data, my first thought was, well, let's create an entire triple with all of our dates and all of the columns. But we really don't need that. Like that was just beyond what our actual test needed to do. What I really cared about was testing that the reactive was filtering on this one variable. And so what I did is I narrowed the scope of my test by only saying, look at this event date column, because that's all I really care about. That's all the reactive is filtering. And so I think the book discussed that a little bit of, you know, think about what are your tests really testing and really just kind of keep your focus on what you explicitly want to test. And so, you know, I kind of came across that experience because I was first trying to create this big test triple with all of my data. And I was like, well, that's not right. All I really care about is this one column. And let's test that one column in our reactive. So the other thing that we need to do is we have to pass in um, with test servers, we have to pass in our application function. Again, remember that to set up a testing framework, you have to convert your application into a package and then set up the application in its own function. And so we also have to pass that server um, portion into this test server. Because again, what it's doing is it's taking this entire server function and it's running it as if it's a Shiny app to run the test. 
Uh, any, what questions or comments do people have about testing reactivity? Seems pretty meta. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where you kind of have to like, I mean, like if you just kind of boil it down to like the base of what it really is testing is it's like, all I really care about is, is, is this filtering like I want it to. Like, I expect that if a user of my application is changing that date range input, I just expect that this reactive is going to filter. That's all, that's all I'm testing. And so, but you have to do a bunch of like steps to make sure that you get that test to actually work. And so um, it's, like, it's like a lot of things wrapped in another thing, wrapped into another thing, wrapped into another thing. And then it's like, oh, then I get this nice little test that runs. And so um, I think one thing that kind of helped me clear it up was thinking about these are just functions, right? These are just functions. And so all we're really doing is testing input output in the context of a React in a reactive environment inside of the shiny server. And that kind of helped me kind of reconcile with what was going on. Cause these are just functions, you know, what else, what other questions do people have? Excuse me. Okay. So the next, uh, the next portion that was going to be discussed was let me shut these real quick. Was this idea of testing reactivity inside of a module? It's very similar. Um, the first thing that you have to set up is obviously you have to have a module within your application. And so in my example, I set up a module. Um, and actually doing this, doing this for the first time, I actually kind of figured out modules a little bit better than I did before. So this was kind of helpful because I was struggling with modules until I actually had to force myself to do it to create a test. Um, but if I go back to my application here, you'll see inside of my code, what I do is I have this, um, I have this module that has these two functions, trend viz table input and this trend viz table server. And basically what this is doing is it's taking um, or it's creating part of the inputs that I have for my application. And it's also um, outputting like the trend, the two trends, and then the table itself. And so if we jump over into that module, which is going to be in my R folder, it's going to be that mod trend viz table. Here's that module that we've created. And um, what I want to do in my test, because again, this is just basically a function itself, or these are two functions that we have. I set up a function here to test if my mean trend reactive is valid inside of my um, module itself. So inside of my module, I have a reactive that gets created. So this, I think I have three reactives. So I have this mean trend that I'm testing. So here's the test that I wanna run. I wanna make sure that that reactive is outputting the correct mean value that I had. And so it's this, it's basically the same thing with a couple different um, options that you have to set. Um, the first thing you have to set is this data equals reactive val. I'm not 100% sure why this is the case of why you need to do this first, but it was in the book and it made it work. Um, I know that's not the most satisfying answer, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working with my inexperience with testing and my inexperience with modules here. So if anybody has any input of why this is needed, please let me know. But what I had to do is, is then I had to create my test data, which was um, the mean values that I wanted. And then what I have here is I have to do the same thing as I did before. I have to set up this test server function, but instead of passing in the whole application function, I pass in the, um, the function name for the server function or the module, the module server function that I'm running. And then I pass in the arguments that I want. The arguments have to be in a list. Um, I pass in some test data that I wanna use. And then I just do some expect equal. So this mean trend reactive that I have in my, um, this mean trend reactive that I have in my module, 
I'm making sure that it matches with this test data here. Now, the other thing that the book discussed is that if you're going to be doing a testing inside of a met module framework, you have to include this sessions flush react function or this kind of sessions flush react. Um, to be 100% honest, I'm not sure why, but you have to run that. And so um, I don't know if anybody has any input of why you would need to run this sessions flush react. But you just have to if you're going to have multiple tests and to run your tests inside or to run your tests for your server portions of your modules. I think, <coughs> Colin, go ahead. I, go ahead. I believe I believe in the relation of our scripting versus what is actual HTML slash JavaScript. I just finished this presentation earlier today, so I'm I'm just really briefly coming to the to the conclusion possibly of what's going on here. The session flush reactive is passing back to your test function the calculated values displayed on the screen. This isn't your server calculations. It's what mm. is because it's a reactive call. It's passing back and forth between the browser and the and the and the server. So the flush reactive is kind of almost like resetting it, like taking a snapshot and passing it back over to that uh, input to your to your test function. Going up to the top with your reactive val data uh, object reactive val, I think what we're doing there is allowing a placeholder for any of the past variables sending to the browser and then validating it with what expectations we're supposed to be calculating, right? So it's just a, it's a placeholder uh, alone. Whatever massive cre uh, creation of, of data workflow that we have, we have uh, developed within our Shiny app, regardless of anything that's going on, if I, it's kind of like almost like a T-pipe, right? If, if I have this workflow, this one function I want to send back uh, to evaluate, uh, is it accurate? Is that uh, the correct uh, value of, of, of losing my place here? Is that the correct value that my function was intending to calculate? Does it match what my expectation is, yes or no? Do I pass the test or not? The flush react val and the uh, object uh, for your react val, I think those are placeholders. I think it's flushing your pipeline, fl uh, flushing your your uh, function, uh, and then saving whatever that particular uh, session uh, exchange created. I, I may mm -hmm. be, I'm I'm probably screwing up my vocabulary when I'm trying to explain what's going on, but um, you always remember that you've got these placeholders. You're pop you're creating these placeholders, and then you want to populate them with what is happening in runtime. Oh, because uh, I, I think I, I think I see what you're saying is because I'm passing these arguments into it, right? Like I'm passing this input data data into it. And then I create this data that I'm passing into it to use rather than the inputs that are coming from, you know, the client side of the UI. It's coming from the actual test itself. And so to clean that out, I have to have that placeholder for it to receive that data and then I define it inside of my testing environment. Is Am I on the same wavelength? You're on the same wave, wavelength and you did a better job at explaining what was going on, yes. I think that makes sense to me too. Um, <laughs> I don't know, does anybody remember like, does anybody remember that movie Old School with like Will Ferrell and he does the debate part and then he just like does this awesome really like debate, you know, just as this like awesome argument Mm -hmm. And then he's just like, I just blanked out. I, I think I, that just happened to me right there. <laughs> I, I, I get a better sense of it. But like when you start explaining it, there's just a lot of steps that you're like, this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. So, um, but I'm glad it made sense to somebody. <laughs> um, but no, I appreciate that explanation because that cleared that up for me, Ryan, quite a bit, because now I understand that this is a placeholder. And now that you have this placeholder, you're defining it inside of your actual testing environment. Because I keep I keep going back to this idea that these are just functions, right? They're just functions. And so, you know, you have different environments for your function versus your module versus your application. So you have like nested environments within it. So that's where it just gets kind of wonky for me. Um, 
I got, uh, so yeah, thanks. I appreciate that, Ryan. Um, the other thing that I'm doing here as well is I'm testing my um, two plots. So I want to make sure that these two plots are ggplot objects. I don't know if this was the best way to test if they were, but basically what I'm doing is I'm taking this purchase plot reactive. I'm calling the class. And when you call the class, it returns two string objects, this gg and ggplot. And so that was my test to make sure a ggplot is getting outputted to the UI. I don't know if that's the best way to test it, but it's another way to catch it of like, if like if for some reason my my mean filtering still worked, but then the ggplot didn't work, I still have a test to cover, you know, to make sure that those plots are actually getting outputted to the UI itself. That's the Boolean that you produced a graphical object, correct? So if you were to like render some weird variable and you got an error message in your in your output, um, that would invalidate or, or or create a false statement from that test case. We want to make sure that there's an actual object or a, or a image, PNG, vector graphic, whatever the case is, it's of class ggplot as it's being rendered into the, into the document object model. The server's sending it. We need to make sure that that is of that form if it is some error message or some textual validation that would create a false statement, correct? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's exactly it. I okay. mean, the book, the book also talks about, and I'm not going to cover it here, but like, you can also do like a PNG test where like you could like output a PNG of it and then have that PNG file and kind of do what we did with the expect snapshot and do like the PNG with the PNG because a, a PNG is just data. And so that data would match up with that data. And I think that's what's happening. Or but is it in, just... Go ahead. Or is it just checking the file extension? That's why I, I was curious on, on I'm going to get into the security in a moment, but um, so if the test function is looking for a file extension of PNG um, as a namespace path, does it exist? Yes, it's, it's available. Okay, we pass test true. If we put any other file extension in there, then it should invalidate or, or uh, uh, create a false statement uh, with our, our test function. I'm trying to think of like, man in the middle type insertion of like, okay, I'm going to replace this with a different PNG. I don't think it's a CRC calculator or anything of that nature. I, I, I have to believe that it's, it's as simple as just, does it match file extension underscore dot PNG? I, I'm, I'm curious if, if Kevin or, or uh, Connor, if you guys have any theories on that too. This test is, is not checking the output because there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no file being written, right? It's not even not even being saved in a, in a, in a temp drive. It's still within the R session, it's but an R it, object. It's still of class ggplot though, right? Or still right, of class there's, but there's no, there's no file. Yeah, and, right? and that's, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Connor, you may cut you off. I think I'm done. Um, I mean, like I, this is the, this is the way I thought of it is like, just run the class command. And again, like this may not be the right way to test if you're getting a ggplot output. This was just my first, like, Hey, this is a quick test to make sure it's outputting is this class gg ggplot, you know, call class and then test to make sure you, you receive this vector of gg ggplot. Is it like actually testing that a PNG file is getting outputted? No. The test doesn't really cover that. It just covers to make sure that when you call class on this object, that these two things get returned. Well, no, I, I support Connor's statement of it's not an actual file. You're not you're not really dealing in that at all, Connor. What I was I think what I was trying to 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 go after though is if this were a shiny app and the server is sending that media to the client, the browser of of user interaction. The test validation is ensuring that, yes, when we create that media object, it does match the class of ggplot. I'm curious, uh, Colin, do you, uh, this isn't a, an active app, right? You don't have a UI for this? Mm -mm. Okay, never mind. Uh, oh, act, yeah, an active app? Yeah, I mean, this app, run, this application runs. Well, I was, I, I wanted to actually go in and, and render it, open it in your browser, and then do dev tools. Um, I want to see what the uh, container uh, would be for that generated output. This will work. 
yes, yeah, so do an inspect. And then within your, uh, your source, uh, if you select your source tab, and it should be shared maybe. Now that's weird. I, I'm looking for some kind of a, a, a placeholder for this. It would be in your HTML index text as well as what it's called. So I'm wondering, Connor, if the if the validation of that particular sequence as either GG or GG plot is that just a textual reference to that as the class ID that it's looking for or class type that it's looking for? It's the class within R. Okay. I think it's checking it before it even gets to the browser. Okay, so it's 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 looking at the servers and even before sending it over. Right. You could probably test. The, okay. the client side by testing the HTML mm. does it have this HTML class? Mm -hmm. I th yeah, I think I think we're getting confused between the R class and the HTML class. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I'll pause then. I'm sorry for adding that confusion. No, but that but you, you could probably test it on the client side too. That's interesting. Okay. No, I mean that's a that's a great point because I think that gets to that part of the book is like because I mean again I'm not a, a web developer by any means I'm just digging into the elements of it but here's the actual PNG that it outputted here's the image source and so you probably could use this in some type of expectation test right you have your expect expected PNG and your um your expected PNG and then the outputted PNG and so that probably gets at what it was discussing. It wouldn't be from a graphical thought process though. That would be doing some mathematical like CRC MD5 type checking. And if the values are equal, then we know that it, it rendered properly the, the object or the media type rendered properly. No, uh, right above the, the line of text that you're highlighting there, Colin, um, it's the div tag. And mm -hmm. so it's classed shiny plot output, shiny bound output. No, it never mind then. I'm gonna I'm gonna retract my statement. I think Connor is more correct than where I'm going with the subject. And and I mean I think it's it's you know I mean this I think these conversations are good because you know it's starting to go a little bit further into like the philosophy of what you're testing, right? Like what you're actually testing. Because in my mind, I sit here and say, you know, with my naive perspective, like, oh, this is just perfect for me to make sure that I'm testing a ggplot object is getting output. It's not a test of if this is actually creating a PNG media that's getting put to the UI. It doesn't test that. It just tests to say on the server side, it's outputting. Well, technically the test is, is the output only outputting these two, this vector of gg, gg plot. I mean, I could spoof this probably and figure out a way just to pass that vector and pass the test if I wanted to, but. Or it could just be a, like a, it's an R object, it could be empty, but you could assign the class. Oh yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah, yeah, you that's know, a great it point It wouldn't too. check, like it wouldn't check if there's any data, like if, if, if it's not checking the content contents of the grob. Hmm. In the in the GG plot, it's just checking the, the class attributes of the objects. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's just interesting. Again, it's just one of those things of like, what are you actually testing? You know, like what are you actually testing? And so, I the book doesn't the book kind of talks about that a little bit, but it doesn't really dive deep into that of like because that gets into like more of the philosophy part of it of like what are you actually testing? what's your framework and what's important to you and your team and the value of your application that you're creating. So, um, excellent. Yeah, that's, that's great. That kind of cleared up some stuff for me too. So I might have to trash this mouse. Um, I kind of want to get through some of this cause I want to make sure I give Ryan some time here. Um, you know, the testing JavaScript part, I'm just going to cover this because I don't really have an example for this because I couldn't get it working and 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 I'm not a, an expert about this. But if you have, if you want to test job or some elements in Shiny call on JavaScript rather than um, HTML or some of the reactivity stuff that we've been working with. So what you have to do is you have to set up a, you actually have to run those tests inside of a browser. Um, and to do that, you have to create what's called a headless browser. And to do that, you have to use some tools called Shiny Test. There's also one called Puppeteer or Selenium. 
I don't have experience with these, but if you have some JavaScript elements or you need to test JavaScript inside of your application, read this in the book. It talks about it. It talks about how to set it up. I just don't have enough experience to provide any more context. And I, and I couldn't get it to work. In my application that I had, I tried to add some elements that would have some JavaScript, but I just, I couldn't get it to work. Uh, you can look at these in regards to some helper functions that kind of simplify the expectations. Um, so instead of writing like expect equal, uh, there's some ways to kind of do some things like expect name or expect set equal, just different type of expectation functions that are out there. Um, just look at the test, test that reference page. You can look at those different expectations and see how they could be helpful for you. Some workflow stuff is available in RStudio to make this thing faster. I've just found it to, if you want to run your tests, shift Apple key T, shift control T for Windows people. Learn those because you're going to be doing it a lot. I've learned that. You're going to be running those a lot. So um, just kind of learn those like workflow things to make it faster. The book talks about setting these key bindings. I haven't set them up, but you can set them up and the book kind of talks about it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can you go back to your R session? And when you run those, sure. um, like the shiny test server, how did you get that? Can you run that as a regular, under a regular dev test? Or do you have to run shiny app tests? Uh, for like the ones that are in the module? Yeah. Yeah, they just, they, they look like they run, at least from my perspective, it looks like they run when you just do a normal test. No kidding. Because when I do tests, I have to do mine separate. I have to do like a regular uh, test that test on the, like the data. And then I do, I do a very simple server test and I have to run, run shiny app tests. That's how I have to get. So I was curious. I didn't see you mention that. So I was like, maybe I'm missing something because my that server test doesn't run off the uh, when I regularly do my testing, so I may be doing something wrong. <laughs> would by well by changing the the uh, function called uh, Kevin would using shiny test would that uh, satisfy instead of actually calling on run app? So it doesn't run the rest. If I do run shiny app, it doesn't run the rest of the data validations on it. Right. So I just run two tests. Okay. And but I guess the good. other the other question is, do you have your actual application code wrapped up into a function? Yeah. Hmm. I, but to be honest, I don't have enough experience to answer that. I'm not sure. I mean, the, hey. the way the way I'm running my test suite is I'm just doing like shift Apple T. I know you're on Linux, so it's probably shift control T if that makes any difference. But I, okay. that's, right. that's, that's not the most satisfying answer. I know yeah. that. <laughs> I was curious because I'm like, you know, this is just the way. I, and maybe I just started doing it that way. <laughs> I don't know. So I just I like after I saw that, I was like, wait a minute. You did. So I have to run shiny. Run. There's a function within shiny to run your tests um so that's what i have to run to get those uh separate shiny specific tests so yeah i'm not 100 percent sure if there's anybody out there you know that knows more just add it to the slack i'm, I'm saying that to people who watch this later <laughs> because i do not have enough experience the other I'm thing happy that... it runs <laughs> but <laughs> yeah i don't have it i mean <laughs> this is a moment where i have to be like yep i i don't know <laughs> um the other thing that was kind of i don't know if this was the right way to do this but there was something that i had to do with my module test oh, i can't remember or something or something with my module that i had to wrap mod trend viz table i had to do something like to get it to work uh oh. I can't remember. It was like I had to wrap something in reactive to get it to work. Oh, I can't believe I'm missing it because it was, I was going to ask the group if they knew what the issue was. It wasn't that namespace thing, was it? That was a <sighs> comment from Kevin that catches everybody. 
I don't know if it was the namespace. It was something where I had like data and I had to wrap it. I'm not going to waste the group's time trying to find it, but um, I had to do something to like pass it into this test where I had to like wrap data in reactive. Yeah, I'm not going to waste the group's time trying to find it. So um, if I find it, I'll, I'll see if I can figure it out. Um, so that's that. Like I said, I'm just try I'm trying to get through it because I want to get to security tonight if we can. Um, there's some other interesting things. Uh, the previous cohort listed some stuff out there to, that explains more of this. I added to this one. There's this wonderful um, workshop that was put on by Our Ladies Philly called Getting Started with Unit Testing. This session was kind of like my first exposure to like unit testing and it was very accessible it was it was centered on for beginners to be like hey you've never done testing before let's approach it and it only covers unit testing it doesn't talk about shiny but it was a great it was very accessible for me for me to be like oh okay i can write tests you know um so that was good so other than that that's um that's testing in all of its in all of its flaming glory, <laughs> I was going to comment on the Selenium uh, uh, comment uh, earlier with having a headless server. I in the engineering shiny apps that was one of my tasks was to go off and research a little bit about Selenium. I've never used it before, not familiar with it, not an expert at it, so um, I'm only knowing what the reference implies. A headless server is kind of think of it as kind of a ephemeral Docker instance-ish sort of concept where um, you're passing your data, expecting it to uh, evaluate properly and then um, be able to test, uh, confirm that yes, that's actually what I should be doing, yes or no. That Selenium allows you to orchestrate in that JavaScript world of being able to test the, the UI side of things, so. I think the way that I've thought about Selenium, I've, I haven't used it like more than, you know, just doing the basic, basic tutorials, but the way I think about it is that it puts the website you're visiting in the matrix where you're fooling it into thinking that it's working with the user when really it's just taking input from your code. That's a good reference. Yeah, that would be a great, great uh, example. It's, it's really it's, useful for, for uh, the, the main use cases I've seen are if you're trying to scrape a website and you have to interact with the website in some set way, like set steps, you can have the Selenium thing do some steps, sleep for a second, wait for a button to populate, and then hit that button, and then mm -hmm. scrape the, the stuff that comes after. But it automates that. Um, before we switch over here to Ryan, um, I found that, uh, let me share here real quick. I found that screen or that where I had to add that reactive. So <clears throat> I don't know if anybody can explain this to me, but I have this module, right? TrendViz table server. I had this reactive data. Um, when I passed it into, I was first trying to just pass data into my server function for that module. It wouldn't work until I wrapped reactive. I don't know why. If somebody can explain that to me, I have no idea why. And it may be because I don't totally understand modules as much as I probably should at this point. Um, but yeah, for some reason, I had to. Yeah, go ahead. Could that be a global versus local uh, variable? So like it's, it's used in the function, but it doesn't return anything. Mm -hmm. By wrapping it, it makes it available for another function to use. Maybe it could even be just an, like a namespace thing. Like, isn't data like isn't that a like a sort of reserved object? Yeah, it's a function. Yeah, it's just a reactive. It's just a reactive but, expression right here. No, but but I actually, if you type in question mark data in your console, it's a function in in, in the package. Oh yeah yeah yeah. I've been running into that problem. Yep, you're right because it. I've been running into that problem lately. I've, I've switched over to DF. Like yeah, I've me run too. Into just some, just some, actually, I bet if I change this to DF, it probably would work. But yeah, I, yeah, that's a good point. It's a global variable. So 
or yeah so good point the problem is that do you have is also a function name <laughs> so you, you any, be careful anything that you want to name data i need i need a name that gets reserved for or isn't reserved i'm just going to revert to x from now on uh, no yeah. call everything colin just <laughs> name all of your your uh, uh temporary data storage just name it colin so that it will be different from the libraries of expectation my initial CKB or something. And all <laughs> there my... you go. Right. So if I ever write a package that gets any popularity, they always remember. <laughs> what the heck is this variable or what's this called uh, for? That's funny. I think those are known as poor design principles. So um, good, good comment. <laughs> anyways, uh, so Ryan, um, if you want to, we got about 15 minutes. I think we probably start at least start the conversation. I, no, I, I security is actually, I, it, it, it didn't, it wasn't what I expected when I read the chapter and I'm like, well, that was kind of worth, not worthwhile. No, I, it's not bad. I was expecting, you know, this whole, you know, OAuth and, and SSH keys and all this crazy stuff that, that uh, uh, of expectation. And then when I actually read the chapter, I was like, well, Okay, that was uh, not not what I expected. Anyway, uh, 13 minutes, 15 minutes, that'll probably be enough for me to cover the topic. It's not, uh, it, it kind of skips across the pond. There are options for us to deep dive into this, but um, let me uh, share screens and I'll go from there. Um, for the team, I, I, I will have to admit that this is my uh, second presentation for the evening, but it's actually my third cohort for the day. Um, I'm not uh, not brain swamped, but we have covered a lot of information for the the afternoon. All right, move that there. There we go. Okay, so you'll have to. I have to apologize for my numbering sequence. Um, Colin, the my GitHub repo mirror of yours is kind of a mess. So um, my numbering sequence doesn't come out like I intended for, and so I'm just. Forewarning anybody, uh, John had mentioned that there was some screen reading thing that was happening on YouTube uh, that you were a part of. And so um, I don't want this to be chapter 23. That's not actually the number, it's, it's 22. Uh, the learning objectives for this chapter, all things security, is we wanna learn various methods to secure your Shiny app. What it implies is that there are server side and client side uh, vulnerabilities that we wanna protect from. Learn the various techniques to protect sensitive data, namely your uh, CSV file or the database that you're accessing or any sort of variables in that relation that you want to uh, limit a person accessing sensitive media. I do have an example of that uh, coming up. Methods to protect your passwords. Uh, a lot of uh, our, our uh, users by default will automatically um, post username and passwords in their source code and then version control it and then make it publicly available to anybody else. And there you go, you've just uh, released your vulnerability or sorry, you created your vulnerability. And then the last is prevent malicious code execution by excluding server side evaluation. Um, this one is, is about four, uh, four groups. I will try to cover all four of them. Uh, security is everyone's concern. Everybody that uses the computer accesses your server, uh, DevOps, sysadmins, uh, network engineers, et cetera. Everybody should be concerned with security. As a Shiny developer, particularly Kevin, I'm thinking of you and, and, and Colin, uh, Connor, I know you've done some uh, Shiny development as well. Um, as a Shiny developer, your responsibility is really your code base, making sure that you're not opening up a path for somebody else to enter your, your app and, and pwn the server or, or uh, uh, scrape anybody's uh, uh, sensitive data. Uh, however, this is a thought is only one error to a larger problem. A lot of people will like to sidestep in their development process. I'll worry about security later. I'll, I'll evoke it at a later point in time. No, always start out from the get-go, include the security component. Um, it will only save you in the future um, instead of uh, allowing you to, uh, I don't know, leave your 
front door open, uh, you know, in a, in a big city, and then expect that everyone's going to not break into your apartment. Uh, it's going to happen. It's just inevitable. So you want to protect that. Uh, however, this is a thought. Uh, this is a thought only uh, in 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 a larger problem. If you sidestep it, uh, it's probably not the first time that you've done that, and you may have a larger um, security vulnerability within your your uh, current uh, practices. When securing your app, there are two main thoughts uh, to be uh, concerned with. Uh, the first is your data. You want to make sure the attack can't access any of the sensitive information. Again, I mentioned databases, CSV files, security type details, etc. And then finally, your computer's resources. Um, surprisingly, uh, one of the biggest attacks that are happening currently on Mac computers and Linux computers is that a user opens up their root access. Once somebody gets into your root, it's, it's game over. You can literally change anything and, and, and take over, zombify that computer. Examples include Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, which is pwning your server. And then the second is having a zombie server that's just spamming people with packet, uh, 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 packet uh, DNS type attacks. Okay. All right. Uh, your role as a developer is to ensure your security within your app. That's really the extension, but you want to have the mindset of what other possibilities might be out there uh, so that you do not uh, provide that gateway of access. There is a citation uh, within our textbook. It's a bitly link, uh, and it's to Colin Gillespie, uh, Gillespie's uh, 2009 user talk. I do recommend watching it. It was actually very comical, and I have a couple of notes here. Um, one of his prerequisites to being a hacker is to wear a hoodie. Um, you always have to have a hoodie on. And then also, uh, all of your text in terminal uh, is going to be rendered in green text because you think you're you're in the matrix and your username is Neo. That's a joke. I'm trying to be funny there. Um, I, I put a presentation reminder for myself. Uh, Colin, this is the point where we may run out of time just because I'm long-winded. But um, in 2015 and 2016, I started a quest of generating a host number of servers. Uh, I was creating this e-learning LMS environment, um, support network, Drupal, WordPress, a version on and on and on, um, all to support the generation of e-learning content. The only server that was exposed to the outside world was my Moodle server. Now, I was running all the security updates and it was an HTTPS authentication on and on and on. It was alive for, I would say, five months, six months. I had not been uh, messing with it for a while. And I accessed and I realized, I'm like, what the heck? There's a bunch of directories here that I don't recognize. There's a bunch of packages here that I don't think I installed. Maybe you know my last systems update I did, but I went back and looked at my log files and I didn't see where any of these uh, points were, were entered. Uh, was I running a zombie? I don't know, but I ended up turning off my DNS. I, I broke my uh, A-list uh, uh, reference to my IP address and just shut the server down completely. Um, I go back to that story again and again because it's four or five years later. It's still something that I'm not sure of. And I guess that's really the, the problem with the security vulnerabilities. If you're not sure, it's probably a security leak. If you're not locked in without you know doing all all your testing features and, and uh, uh, true environment, development environment type concepts. If you're not sure, it's probably a security vulnerability. There's going to be somebody that's going to, to hack your system. Okay. All right. Keep going. I only have three slides to this, so that's why I'm saying it won't take long. Um, I do want to run this particular Shiny app because I found this fascinating. In, in earlier team, I, I presented the JavaScript section within engineering grade Shiny apps. Uh, and this was actually a, a concept that uh, uh, I discussed during that presentation. So this is uh, near and dear to, to today's uh, media. Protecting your data is paramount without question. You, you only have one chance. And if, if somebody is compromising that one chance, it's over. Uh, you've got to either start everything over again, recreate your database. Um, Kevin, you've made multiple references of uh, a SQL database and then resetting the table uh, or deleting table, um, injecting code. So that's uh, probably near and dear to your, your heart as well. Specifically for the topic is passwords and APIs. Don't put them in your source code. Don't version control them. Don't make them publicly accessible. Um, and if you do watch 
uh, Mr. Collins' uh, uh, presentation, the link earlier. Um, <laughs> he's got a YouTube video of people just sharing their uh, passwords in public um, to an interviewer. The first thing is never write your uh, username or password to plain text script ever. I mean, never, ever. Don't ever do it. It's not something you should do. Um, exclude sensitive information from being version controlled. Um, add these particular files uh, to a git ignore uh, so that they will never be passed into your version control system. Never attempt user authentication rules yourself. Uh, even if you think you know uh, that you have everything covered, there's more than likely vulnerabilities. And that goes back to my Moodle story, the, the server development thing that I was sharing with you. I thought I had covered all the bases and it obviously must have left something open. Okay, let's run this particular Shiny app real quick. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to my R session and run it from there. Because I do wanna go into the browser, which hopefully I can drag this over. Uh, Team, let me know on the desktop if you're seeing the browser window, Chrome. Okay, good. So nothing really magical is happening here. It's just a, uh, a selector box and our drop-down menu, and we have options A and B. Okay. Well, in truth, we also have variables C and D that were stored in memory, but due to the fact of how this Shiny app was structured, um, we can do a little bit of fancy Java work and access, uh, JavaScript work and access uh, variables C and D. So I need to go copy my text real fast. And that is on here. I'm not as uh, eloquent as Colin with preparation. Um, I don't have things quickly stored. Um, that's a uh, yeah, feather in your hat, Colin. I think you're better at presentation in that case. Come on now. All right. So to access your JavaScript console, you have to go into DevTools. A um, couple of options of getting there. One is right-clicking or using your three buttons to, to get to your uh, DevTools option, or it's just F12 in most browsers. Once we get into our console, uh, I've selected the console option down here at the bottom, and then I'm going to paste in that command. So this is a shiny data object within the document object model. It's kind of what uh, Connor had mentioned before. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, stored memory area that isn't called in most structures, but you can go into console and, and call it out. So shiny, and then I set input value. What I'm doing is I'm setting it to value C. Pull this down just a second, so you can see what happens. So right now, variable A is my username, John Doe. Once I run or execute this code, it gives me my social security number. Or if I change the input again to option D or object D, now it's going to be giving me my credit card information. Okay. The way to protect this is to evaluate on the server's side whether to send it or not. And that is the updated text, which is the code snippet, where we have the option of in. So if you notice the difference between the server side here and the server side here. We're adding this requirement of input X, evaluate, and then whether or not it's allowed or not. Okay, And then secrets, we call that input X. So this now protects your code, or the intent is that it protects your code and doesn't render. Um, I don't have an example of that working. So I'm assuming that it, it would prevent that from going through. OK, next example, or next Slide deck. Okay. Uh, computer resources. Here's where um, this gets a little bit long. This is the last section, uh, security, Colin. So let me know if I'm reaching that limit and we want to cut off. There um, are. We're, we're, we're at seven o'clock. I mean, how, oh, okay. How, how, well, how much longer do you think? Like, I don't know, five minutes maybe? I don't. Um, what does the group think? Do you think we can get this finished in five minutes or? I can or pick up next week too. It's fine with me if we keep going, but okay. uh, yeah, that's me. I don't want to exclude anybody. Fine with me together. too. That's okay, fine. cool. Let's let's go for it. In the nature of computer resources, what we're referring to are those uh, shared memory between your server and your UI. Um, by default, Shiny as a service does not uh, pass variables back and forth between servers. However, unless you use cache memory, and that's a different topic. There are the first 
uh, instance here is where you're having these inline module formulas where you can go in and add another, I think of this as like a fingerprint, um, where somebody would not be able to change this text and render this module formula. Uh, it's still going to, to expect this print high. So um, it's possible to construct a module that executes arbitrary R code. Um, the uh, data frame uh, of X one through five, uh, run if five, and then the mod um, linear model passing the Y variable with print high and then X. So when this generates, you're gonna get that print high in the middle of it. Um, maybe I'm incorrect, but the, the point saying is that code will run this next point about glue labels. Uh, code will run inside the curly brackets and that's actually where your, your uh, potential vulnerability is at. In the glue labels option, um, what we have here is uh, creating a title, uh, adding foo, uh, number is one, and then gluing these two together. So concatenating uh, title and number together. This has the ability of being a vulnerability because of the curly brackets. The glue function allows for a evaluation or a, a uh, oh, it's the parsing of that data. Um, so you can change this to say title print and then add high in the middle of it um, with the number. And that'll actually uh, be an unsafe way of, of uh, poning or, or, or compromising that particular call. To make that more secure, what you wanna use is the glue safe option. And then finally, variable transformations. I actually uh, stopped here uh, because it really got really long talking about SQL language. Um, Kevin, if you and I want to get together, I'm happy to, to talk about this, but I wanted to uh, send a URL link uh, to a web video of a SQL injection issue. It doesn't have to be about Shiny. It could be you know, PHP. It could be um, you know, some other language, Ajax, that accesses database type calls. I don't think Ajax does that. But um, either way, SQL injection allows us to insert um, SQL language, direct databasing SQL language into a server call, browser to server call. And you can actually take over, delete tables, modify tables. Um, it's where a lot of people will scrape uh, user accounts from a database if it's unsecure. Um, so there's some authentication points that happen in here. In the example in the textbook, it has a uh, hyphen hyphen at the end, uh, which I was told or, or explained that that was a comment and that if you need to include the comment, um, otherwise it will give you error code and won't run, render on the database. Um, it's just a shortcut way of, of uh, compromising that SQL call. Uh, Kevin, do you want to add to that at all? You seem to be more database oriented than anybody. No, I don't. Okay. Don't, have don't you have anything more to add? <laughs> well, other than the, the experience you were telling us about early in our book club where <laughs> you were having SQL issues, uh, have you ever had any of the team members execute or, or try to access with injection? Not on purpose. Okay. <laughs> Not within our framework. People do strange things. So, okay. You know, like, right, right. You just can't anticipate. Like, why would you do that? Well, <laughs> but I, I, I'll see if I can. Let me copy this link and I'll put it in our Slack because the or in our Zoom call. Um, uh, maybe I'll put it in Slack because that's more persistent. The uh, this was a video I watched five six years ago, and the. Uh, I found it riveting in the sense that how easy SQL injection can change, um, especially when we live in the world of API calls and you can start to, I don't know, possibly if you're not protecting your API, um, you might be able to compromise from a browser standpoint and uh, uh, do things that were not initially intended uh, for accessing possibly sensitive data. Um, security is a topic that uh, is, is touched on very lightly but it has severe ramifications if it's not managed properly. So you only have that one time, I guess is my point. So. Excellent, thanks Ryan. Colin, what do, you, what do you think on that subject? I could probably expand on this. Like I said, I thought this was gonna have a bunch of OAuth and, and uh, uh, GGP, uh, is that the right word, GSP, GSA? GGP. Uh, thank you, uh, a different security certificate mechanisms built into this chapter and it that's not what this was about so 
I think they're I mean, the only thing. Okay. Sorry, Connor, go ahead. Uh, um, the only things I would add is that um, you need to understand your threat model. Um, so like I have a shiny app that makes predictions about house sale prices in Pittsburgh. There's no PII, you know, there's nothing I need to protect. They're not, not doing credit card transactions. No one's gonna come after me specifically. The only real threat there is that someone could hijack my server and use it to mine cryptocurrency or something stupid like that. All right, so that's just a matter of locking your doors and not leaving your keys on the dashboard, right? That, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's gen, is it January? Is that how they pronounce the, the uh, current um, data modeling exercises that everyone's doing? It's, it's uh, uh, gene um, data. It's bio, bio, bio data science. And the, uh, the, in the video that, that Colin had provided the link to, uh, to the uh, 2019 user, um, he made a reference that even the CRAN package had a potential vulnerability. He went out and bought a bunch of URLs um, for uh, potentially somebody mistyping, you know, dev tools, install, GitHub, HTML, whatever page, and then you download, you know, all these packages. Well, he purposely, this uh, Jumping Rivers uh, uh, engineer, purposely bought 13 URLs. And then he did an Apache log uh, representation of how many errors occurred uh, while users were typing in the wrong URL to the CRAN package uh, or to the, uh, the uh, repo where you were going to download from the data from. And he was just making that as a comment that said, if you post a 404 error on your server, but now let's say that you do uh, host that particular data set. Let's just say that, you know, this is a, a incorrect server. User types in the wrong error. Uh, you get your data but then you also get a whole bunch of other malware uh, included uh, when you when you uh, downloaded this within R. Um, he was fascinated that that hasn't been a topic of coverage yet. Uh, you don't trust everybody, right? I'm not going to give Colin my my uh, ATM card and PIN number, uh, credit card number and PIN number, uh, only because we live in the state of Lincoln, uh, or sorry, state of Nebraska. Um, we're close associates in a geographic area, but there's a point where you have, um, you can't trust everybody. So security is a point where you want to protect uh, your own personal interests versus those that you want to serve to the public. So, I mean, I, I keep talking about this because there's a lot of like, there's a lot of things that I've come across and, and, and I don't want to hold any backs, anybody back or anything. So if, if anybody has to jump, jump off, um, you're more than welcome to do so. But um, I think the, for me, at least the big picture of the whole chapter was like, um, you know, these are like, like Connor said, don't leave the keys on the dashboard. Don't leave the car running for people to access it. But also know that if you are going to be doing things that require you to, you know, increase your security of your application, there are entire groups of people, your IT professionals within your organization to help you with your authentication. There are third party services to which you could route to take care of these things. If you work in an industry that your data is regulated, like healthcare, you need to be updated on what those regulations are and what are the common practices to secure those data, the, the, the data, the computing resources. I mean, one example that I had of that was I was looking in, and I don't do any healthcare data stuff, but I was kind of digging into Shiny Server and shinyapps.io. Shinyapps.io is very clear that they are not HIPAA compliant. And so if you are connecting Shiny Apps to um, healthcare related data, um, Shiny Apps.io is not where you're gonna, you can't hope, you know, you're not, you're not in compliance if your application is on there. So it's such, it's just such a broad topic that I, I don't even think one, sh no, not even one chapter could cover it because it's an entire industry and, and group of professionals that focus in on this. So, um, but that's my point of view anyways. So anybody else? Speaking of vulnerabilities, I was trying to post my uh, my particular link and it keeps telling me that it's an unsupported file type. Uh, it says it, that it's .zip. Well, that's not correct. I don't wanna send a .zip in our, in our Slack channel stuff. So <laughs> just a, a comment there, I'll find the right URL. And I mean, it's one of those experiences too that you like, you just have to have them 
to like, and I just remember the first time that I ever kicked off like a, a cloud server just to play around with it just on my own. And I think I was like, I can't remember where I got it from, but like I had just like a, a server from a third party service, like really small server just to mess around with, to kind of play around with Ubuntu. And then I remember I logged out for like maybe like three weeks and I came back and, and I could do nothing on it. I was like, what? Like I couldn't run anything. I couldn't do anything. And then I would look at the, all the processes to see what was going on. And it looked like the CPU was running at like 99%. And I was sitting there, I was like, what is going on? Like, did I do something stupid? And then once you start digging into like the forums and stuff, you're just like, oh, somebody probably hijacked this and is doing cryptocurrency stuff. And so it's like, it's just one of those things where you just got to kind of experience it to like, I mean, you don't experience it doing with production stuff, obviously take care of that. But like, once you experience it, you're like, okay, I need to be really careful about this and, and take heed to it. Yeah, I, 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 but I think that's a good example, but is that, is that you don't need to be faster than the bear. You should be faster than, than the guy next to, next, next to you. So just don't be the easy pickings. And I do suggest that, that video because it was really funny because what did they, like he shared that example of that, that 15 year old who hacked into the CIA and he's like, I'm an adult. I need to have my security practice up to a point where a 15 year old can't hack the work that I do. So I was just like, that's a very good point, but it's still crazy to me that a 15 year old is hacked into the CIA. So, um, I'm not hacking into the CIA. If anybody's listening, no. So. Probably gonna hire him. <laughs> so I don't know. And then, and then I also had another experience one time where, like, for the spam farm thing, when you mentioned the spam farm thing, Ryan, I remember one time I was getting like these like weird emails from like some weird domain, and it was like connected with some like some business and in, in the and I'm not gonna say where, but some weird business. And then they were saying that I owed them like hundreds of like tens of thousands of dollars. And then I, they had their contact information. I called them. I'm like, I don't owe you nothing. And this was before I was, you know, smart enough to know it. I didn't give them any personal information, but I said, stop sending me invoices. Um, and then I found out they're like, no, somebody hacked our email server and they're using it as a spam farm. And I'm just like, oh, and he's like, yeah, you don't want to know how many phone calls we've gotten in the past two months. So. <laughs> I know someone had their email hacked and it looked somewhat legit. I was suspicious of it. So I called the person. She, you could just hear the, ex, someone just having a really bad day because someone was giving her a lot of calls because she's sending this hacked email. She's like, I'm like, you know, you're sending this? I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to get take care of it. So, oh. It's a cost of business. I mean, really, if you, if you think of it, if you're, if you're, personal time is, is, you know, a, a, some kind of a monetary value or if, even at work as a business, and you're getting all of these phone calls about, you know, some zombie server or whatever spam server that you're, you, you've created inadvertently. Um, it, it's, it's, it's cost to the business. You're losing money because you're taking care of things that you may have uh, or should have um, talked to a security. Ryan, I think we lost you. No, I don't have my mic on. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I was going to say that uh, uh, the if you're familiar with uh, uh, not Cisco VPN, um, what's the name of the service that they're using that we have? It's an SSO protection thing. Either way, uh, in our legacy company, prior to our merger, uh, they had a service where you were required to sign in to even access this web page, well, that's fine, and the intent is that once you pass it once, it should be you know open to everything. That's not how they've deployed it. Uh, they've taken it to the nth degree, where now if you even access any website within our business, intranet type business, it automatically requires you this this uh, authentication. I won't say that it's annoying. It's more of an inconvenience to a user, um, but it, as we compare it to our our previous business. Um, they didn't have any of those uh, points. And yeah, I've, I've been everywhere and, and done everything within our, our organization, um, all because of that lack of security. So either way. 
I want to remember what it is. I don't want to power up my computer real quick to check, but it's it's one of our our main uh, uh, authentication vendors. Um, and I matter. mean, I mean, kind of to to that point too, Ryan. And going back to like shiny is like, I think the biggest pain point that I keep coming across is just the OAuth portion of shiny. I think I see a question about it like every every quarter somewhere. And it's like, you know, somebody's like, how can I get authentication to it? And it's like, yeah, this is a lot bigger than just one developer can handle, you know? And so, I mean, not, I shouldn't say one person can handle it because somebody probably could, but, um, but it's like, you need to be using a third party service. You need to be working with the team or be working behind, you know, some organization intranet to make sure that you are protecting it and have that authentication portion to it. But that was always the biggest sticking point for me. It was just like, yeah, this is great that I create these applications, but I want to put it behind some protection because I don't want everybody to see it. And so um, I have authentication. I use Shiny Manager, but I don't really keep any, I keep no uh, personal information on anything, but I still authenticate where, and it's still not great because it's like a standard username and password. And I don't like that, but like you need to pay me a lot more if I'm going to manage individual users. So, you know, it's kind of a stop, a little bit of a stop gap in there, but there's really nothing that interesting unless you want to see how many surveys have been entered by site. So, you know, and some outcome data, but it's not by the person. So it's aggregated out. But. I know it's not a topic of security. It's not a topic of security. It's a whole completely different uh, thought process, but um, just managing sensitive data as, as prospective data science individuals um, using, using media, um, there's, a, there's a piece to this where you want to start hashing and, and uh, salting your, your data set to protect users' uh, uh, credentials. Uh, we may access, I don't know, some data set, you know, for our business and happen to leave it on our laptop traveling and the laptop gets stolen. And now they have access to that, that media. Um, if you protect your, even your data. So when I was saying hashing or salting your, your uh, user accounts, um, you have a cipher that unlocks what those values are at runtime. Um, from a plain text standpoint, it's just gibberish. So. Yeah, I started using that too. Yeah. And then the other thing, um, and like you said, Ryan, and again, I, I'm, I'm just pontificating. So if anybody has to go, don't don't stay for my, <laughs> don't, don't stay for me. But um, uh, keys, like keys and credentials, like everything. I mean, most of the stuff is moving on into cloud resources. Um, the cloud is great with like the flexibility that you have but it creates more vulnerabilities for your computing resources. And so, you know, working with my team, because I do work with some younger developers, I always have to remind them, like, protect your JSON keys with your life, because if someone gets access to them, you push them into version control, granted nothing's public, it's all behind, you know, authentication and stuff. It's still, if, if you accidentally put some credentials, some key in there and somebody accesses that, they, they get access to any computing project that we have, and they can kick off a compute resource on that key. Um, granted, you know, you should be working if you're using with those keys, you should be only giving them the access that they need. But, you know, there are certain keys that could give somebody access to your pro to the project level of your cloud project. And you can kick off a 120 gig computer and let it run and run and run and rack up a bill. So. I was thinking Docker Compose YAML files, some of the, some of the scripts inside that, that Docker Compose file. Um, require you to pass authentication. Um, I can't recall if I've witnessed anything that uses environmental variables from your service to create that Docker container. Um, I'm, I'm using a Moodle instance at the moment, Docker Moodle and uh, the Bitnami. Um, the, inside the, the compose file, it actually has MariaDB username and password, uh, Docker uh, Moodle uh, username password and it's plain text. Um, they obviously say that that's not for production level. So um, that's another reference to the uh, video link uh, that I sent. 
he makes a comment about um, uh, our studio servers and the username password is our studio our studio and he goes huh I wonder here's a public access point to indicate all our studio servers in the world let's just grab one of these IP addresses go to the web page type in our studio our studio and see if I can open it and sure enough one of the first instances he he did um, open up the uh, service completely different topic Netgear and uh, Netgear and uh, Linksys routers, um, where it's usually admin password. Um, you're, you'd be surprised at how many people do not protect that. Um, that's a different conversation, different topic, different vulnerability, but same concepts of security. Hmm. So. All right, guys, I've got a job. It was good talking to you all, and I'll see you next week. Yep, we'll talk to everybody next week. Everybody have a good one. All right. Thanks, yep. everyone. All right. Bye.